home every night, I would pass a dark little building along an empty strip of highway. There were no windows on the face of the building, so it had a rather odd appearance, almost like a warehouse. Its parking lot was rutted with potholes. The facades sported a neon sign, exotic dancers every night. This odd little building, sparking equal parts revulsion and curiosity in me became the setting for my photographic exploration of ritualized behavior in strip clubs. I named the series Vague Longings, Little Deaths. The word little deaths is a reference to the French expression la petite mort, which translates as the little death, but it's also it's a euphemism for orgasm. In the process of both making and then showing the images, many issues were raised, including what is my relationship as a woman and a photographer to woman as the object of sexual desire? As a spectator or voyeur, can this relationship be any different than a male perspective that controls the objects of its gaze? Is generic vision always implicitly male? Are the social rituals that are so intensely manifested in the strip clubs different in substance from everyday conscious and subconscious attitudes and interactions? Can photography, which has been the major vehicle for the dissemination of pornography, deal with the issue of pornography without becoming pornographic? These questions are in a postmodern kind of frame of reference, which is a deconstruction of the meaning of images 
looking at our preconceptions and expectations as viewers and trying to take it apart and analyze it. This series of work was included in a group exhibition that traveled throughout New York State and culminated in an exhibition at the National Museum for Women in the Arts in Washington, D.C. I expanded the project to include photographs of local beauty pageants and I changed, I was showing both the beauty pageants and the stripper work inter, interleaved. And um, I changed the title at that point to Through the Looking Glass, Bar Rooms and Beauty Queens. The beauty pageant is a social ritual glorifying the role of woman as the object of the gaze. Here she is both revered and inspected. Both beauty queen and stripper ritualistically embody the locus of desire. Photographing both beauty queens and strippers, I anticipated visual parallels. The same situation transcribed into two different arenas. What I actually discovered in the relationship was not a replication, but a mirror. The underlying, the underlying constructs were the same, but distorted and inverted. What I found and had not expected, at least in my opinion, the beauty queen is model for the feminine fantasy, myth of femininity while the stripper is the male fantasy myth of femininity. The one archetype is an inversion of the other. Both myths rigidly hold woman to her role as spectacle. Welcome. <laughs> Strange photograph, yes? Yes. I'll wait till the door is closed because it's hard to see the screen. Okay. Could you close that, please? Thank you. Okay. In a beauty pageant, to win is everything. It is the embodiment of the quintessentially feminine. To lose is not to be last, but to be anything less than first. The loser suffers a demure hell for they have been found flawed in the essence of their femininity. As an observer of the very young girls especially, as I watched them look to their mothers and study with reverence every aspect of the older pageant contestants, I became acutely aware of the urgency, the need with which such sex role identification is made and how early in life it is established. So now that I've showed you all this wonderful, sexy color work, we're gonna go to the more dark and subdued work. We're gonna go down to the bones. Um, after I, I finished graduate school, um, and th this is only loosely chronological because I continued the beauty pageant work past this time period, but I needed to work, and I got a job teaching uh, photography at um, a school called Sugarloaf, um, and it was a residential lockup school for extremely troubled boys. They were, war, uh, they were placed there by the courts, either because they had committed nonviolent crimes or that because they had been victimized themselves. Um, and I was teaching photography in a tiny little dark room with boys aged 12 to 25 um, who often threatened me and threatened each other. And um, actually I found that my breakthrough with them was when I got them to write because I couldn't send them out with cameras. We could only work with cameras for about 20 minutes a day all together under supervision. So the writing was this huge breakthrough and I have always been interested in photography and writing. In fact, my email address is words and images. It's always, they've always been linked for me. So this is Julio, and he has an arrow pointing at his head. You can see him hanging with his classmates. And he writes, when I was out in the world, I was selling drugs and doing a lot of bad things like breaking windows and just doing more things that my mother was telling me not to do. Not to do the bad thing, to do the good thing. So I didn't listen to my mother, and I started selling drugs, and I got busted and ended here in Pius XII. When I go out in the world, I'm going to listen to my mother and do the right thing, like go to school and start to work. This poem is by Julio. 
Well, he completed this, and he was really a, such a sweet boy underneath this really tough exterior. And the week after he finished this, he was actually pulled out of my class. Um, his mother had died, and um, I never saw him again and never had a chance to return his work to him. So um, it was a revolving door um, at that school. I could never do a consecutive program because people boys would be, would be placed and pulled out and placed and pulled out. Um, this boy, I'm not going to read what he wrote, but he wanted to put himself on a crucifix and we figured out to do it with a multiple print photogram on top of his portrait. And he writes about his first mescaline trip. Um, so I was already becoming deeply involved with the word and its relationship to the image. Um, and I moved to California after that year teaching at that school. I needed to get out of that. <laughs> it was hard. Um, but I still had, I, I think I've always used my camera as a way of visiting places that I might not, as the nice, demure, ladylike woman that I am, have um, gone into. Otherwise, it was sort of like my badge of courage. Um, and I came to California, and I was substitute teaching. And it was like I was sent all over LAUSD, from the north, from San Fernando Valley, out to the west side, down to south central. And I had this enormous view uh, of so many different kinds of campuses. And then the 1993, which may be before some of you were born, but 1993 was the year when Rod, the Rodney King video of uh, the police beating of Rodney King, and it was the, when the police were exonerated of any wrongdoing and civil disruption. Uh, some people call it riot, riot, some people call it civil disobedience, but there was looting and there were fires. And I had been in the schools and I wanted to get inside and see from the point of view of the people, the students that I was working with. So to that end, I wrote up a grant to do a photography and writing workshop. Um, this was the, the California Arts Council. They had a wonderful model for um, a residency program, which unfortunately was defunded about 10 years ago. But there is still um, a Department of Cultural Affairs here in Los Angeles, artist residency, residency program for young or old artists with a drive to work with people in the community and with strong portfolios. It's every year you have to be crazy enough to apply for your job every year. It's a competitive process, but it teaches you a lot, keeps you on your toes, and you are, I always felt like I was a canary, you know, the first one down into the mines, and if there wasn't enough oxygen, you know, you'd fall over. Um, because you're always at the, the ground where the community and the the need, and you're not always working with an arts organization, but it's really great work. It's really important work. This is um, Victor. Victor was in my first From Where I'm Standing photography and writing workshop. The idea was that the students would do a documentary from the inside out. I would provide the cameras. They would do their own darkroom work. Yes, this was black and white film-based photography. Um, and we would also do writing. So um, Victor was very brave, and I'm going to read to you what he wrote. I was part of the riots. I was part of the people doing the stealing and breaking windows, graffiti on walls. It felt good at first, getting things I wanted and couldn't afford. But I wasn't proud after of how I got it. Why did I do it? At first, I was happy and wanted more and more. But after, the feeling of remorse circled my mind constantly. I saw what I and thousands of people did to South Central LA. It really made me feel bad. I destroyed my community. This is a page from his book. This is his photograph of his mother and two sisters. The cameras that I gave them did not have flash. Uh, they were very rudimentary, and uh, they're plastic cameras, so they get a very soft, dreamy quality. I actually love the quality of these pictures. Um, he writes, my mom works for minimum wage plus extra overtime and barely gets enough for rent and food. She has too much pride to apply for, I'm going to swear, 
her fucking welfare. She devotes her life to trying to put food on the table because of an asshole of a father who never took care of the family. So um, I never encourage swearing, but sometimes swearing is what's required when the um, emotion is strong enough. Uh, the writing and the, the photographs, they were never intended to be captions. They were to go parallel to each other. They were separate things that would then create something new when they were combined. Uh, this is a portrait that I took of Mario. Um, at this time, my workshop was now in Lincoln Heights at the Boys and Girls Club in Lincoln Heights. I met Mario when he was 11, and he continued working with me until he was 15 or 16 years of age. I think this photograph, he was about 15, and he was tired of me photographing him. So. Uh, those are his, that's his handwriting. Those are his words. Don't tell my story. Um, and I told him that his story was important. This is a portrait I took of Mario when he was 11. We used to do a walkabout every afternoon after when the kids would come home from school and come to the Boys and Girls Club and we'd begin our workshop. Um, I, he told me this story and I will read it to you. I had three bicycles stolen. They were crappy bikes. One was $10, one was $25, and one was $30. Now I have a good mountain bike. Nobody steals it. I have a heavy chain. The bikes were stolen from my backyard. Nobody steals from my backyard anymore. That was before, because my cousin, he really didn't like his parents that much, and he was living with us. He's kind of in a gang, the Clover, and he told them to keep an eye on our house, so nobody steals from our yard anymore. Everybody's yard gets stolen from. Yes, they do, Gail. I'm telling you, everybody gets stolen from. Don't tell my story. It's not important. Bet you five dollars it's not important. My cousin is dead. He was in a bad car accident, and he was bleeding really bad. He was a gangster, and he was in the back seat, and my aunt and uncle were driving, and they were in a bad accident. And he was stuck in the back seat bleeding, and they couldn't get him out. And the police, they didn't want to call an ambulance because he was a gangster, and he bled to death. Damn pigs. My aunt and uncle moved to Chicago two or three years ago. So I told Mario that his story was important. This is a page from Mario's book. He made several books with me over the years. This is his book from when he was about 11 years old. And it's a photograph outside of a bank in Lincoln Heights. And it's a portrait of, uh, you can see uh, the portrait of Jesus and the, the figure of Guadalupe. And he writes, if I grew up in Mexico where my mom grew up, I'd be different because I'd have a different way of acting. My mom would never have touched a gun or gone to school for long, but I have. She believes in God and all of that, but I don't. So this From Where I'm Standing project also included me. I was also participating in the project, and I was also photographing my world. And I was also very deeply affected by the people, the participants in the workshop. This is actually a portrait of Alicia, my next door neighbor. She came and knocked on my door to uh, show me her first communion dress. And this is a portrait I made of a merchant uh, down um, actually on the Mexico side of the Mexico-US border. Um, I was just really, found it really interesting how long it takes to drive back into the United States through customs there and all the merchants who come out and sell you all of the plastic uh, things that you might have missed while you were in Mexico, instead of buying a real crucifix, you might want one of the plastic ones that are around. But um, I just, I love this photograph. I, to me, it's very emblematic of so many things. But um, I'm going to say it now. Um, I'm a great fan of Anton Chekhov, um, playwright and short story writer, Russian. And he, he says the role of the artist is not to answer the questions, it's to raise them. And so I like to um, poke my finger around a lot of issues and have pe and, and I think the emotional quality to stir that is very important, but I don't like to tell people what to think. I want people to come to that on their own. Uh, this is Martin, and he was also in my first uh, workshop. He was 16. This is a selfie before selfies. When you hold a camera, you can't see what 
it's going to look like, unlike the um, digital cameras now. So you're shooting blind. Also, the camera does not focus any closer than three feet, so I would have to tell them to hold the camera as far away from them as possible. People say the pictures speak a thousand words. I'd like to ask what you can tell about me. What can you possibly know about me from what you see in this picture? Can you tell if I'm hurting or if I'm happy? Can you, uh, this picture doesn't tell you how my inside is. Can you see the real me? This was in 1995, California Council for the Humanities to go back and revisit some of my wor first workshop participants. And this is Martine, the same person, 10 years later. He invited me back into his life and he allowed me to photograph him and his family, his extended family, and he also made a new book. So I have some incredible writing that he did at 26 and 27. Here is Martine holding his nephew, and it's just so, I could talk about the formal qualities of the picture and the triangles and the light and the this, but I'm gonna just let you look at it. And I just really enjoy that he is focused not on himself, but he's focused on his uh, nephew. This is Martine's mother, and um, I had his, his family's permission this is a difficult portrait to make. The obvious record of suffering that this woman has gone through is apparent. I was definitely aware of the crucifix and the legs of the crucifix and her missing limb. I also will tell you that she was blind, but she knew, she knew I was there and Martine knew that I was there. Um, these are difficult images sometimes to make. This is, I call this photograph, hardworking man. And he was a hardworking man. I knew him from the Boys and Girls Club in Lincoln Heights. He had been doing volunteer work there. And I bumped into him while we were doing our photo walkabout. He was showing me his hands after a hard day's work. This photograph actually sold for $2,000. There was a bidding war on it in an auction between uh, Bradley Whitford and, uh, and um, a king of hardworking men. He said one, it was very interesting. Um, this is Melissa and Gabriel. And you can see I'm very interested in hands. And a photography mentor once said to me, you can never have enough hands in a photograph. Hands are so expressive, so telling. And what's especially telling is that um, the young woman has, is looking right at us. This is the ending of the embrace, where she is now aware that she is being viewed. But it's still a very, very tender moment. This is from Alan's book. He was about 11 at the time. This is his portrait of his abuela. Things that I cannot change, my teeth, my hands, my life, my family, things that I can change, my clothes, my voice, my friends, my behavior. I just found the freshness um, of people who are still open-hearted and not too self-conscious with their this is a portrait of Lucero, and this is a page from her book, and it's one of the few times that I allowed someone to write a caption because she had such a hard time with writing. So I asked her to write about what she saw in her photograph. I see a moon shining over the cross and a little star shining at the end of the moon. The moon is in the sky and the star is too. I made the pole look like a cross in the sky. The cross makes me feel as if I see God. This is Jennifer, and in this one, I put her text behind the photograph. So if you actually stopped and look at, looked at it for a long time, you would not be able to read complete sentences. You just get snippets of it, which is most like how we experience people. <laughs> uh, what I liked the most about her was how she described herself as ordinary and also how she talked about how she didn't want to be ordinary. So 
so deeply the experience of me and so many other adolescents, right? at least adolescent women, girls. This is um, Gloria, and she started my workshop when she was nine and continued working with me till she was about 13, 14. She, these, this is her on her front steps. And if you look where her ankles are gracing over the edge of the steps, the next photograph is her portrait, her photograph of the flowers there. And she writes, if a poem is like 100,000 words, it takes 2,110,000 words to finish a poem about you, especially when I look at you through rain, sun, wind, and thunder. Plant, your name is like music to my ears. Uh, this is her grandfather. The family invited me to his funeral and they asked for a, this, a copy of this portrait. It was the best photograph that they, they had for him. Um, I did this workshop for about seven years um, in loosely East Los Angeles. El Sereno, uh, Lincoln Heights, so I just loosely term it that. I did the workshop for seven years in Eagle Rock, and I did the workshop for seven years in Watts. That sounds like 21 years, but some of those times were overlapping, so it was a period of about 15 years. And um, at one point in time, I was working in both Eagle Rock and Watts, and we had the exhibition at Watts Towers Art Center, which, if you've never been there, is an amazing, an amazing place. Um, and uh, the, uh, a journalist from Pasadena, from the Pasadena Weekly came by, saw the show, and said, we've got to do this, we've got to do this. So this is the cover article, and um, that's me with two, three, three of my workshop participants. And um, here are just a couple of the, the page spreads from the article, which was really cool. Um, there is a five minute video on YouTube, which was a promotional video. If I don't run out of time, I'd like to show it to you um, because it gives you a feeling of what that interaction is like and that it's the finished work, but it's also uh, the interaction. Uh, this is, um, when I was working in Watts, I, every year I would try to change the workshop somehow. I always wanted to grow. Didn't want to always be doing the same thing. So I started including adults in the workshop Uh, this is Marisol, and she is a dear friend of mine to this day. And she, in her book, she wrote, I want my life to be full of light, color, and flavor. I want to read, write, and build for myself a world where anything and everything is possible. This is Andrea. And I won't read you her. She, she writes about her family keeping her away from her boyfriend. And, um, and then not so, she disappeared and I ran into her six months later and um, I gave her her book and she wrote RIP, rest in peace on the cover of it and she told me that her boyfriend was, was, uh, had been killed. Um, this is a portrait of Vicky and her son Marquise and her daughter. Marquise and Vicky were workshop participants at the same time. And that was really an amazing experience to be working with parents and kids at, uh, together. I just, I think this is a really strong portrait for a, a lot of reasons. But again, I don't really want to talk about the formal qualities. <laughs> I'm going to run out of time. Uh, this is Fran Shea, and she says, when my grandpa died, I changed my attitude. To me, it means that if anybody says something to me that I can just bomb on them. I felt sad when my grandpa died because he was all I had. And Shada writes, I love my whole family because one day you will, they will not be there for you. Every time I go to school in the morning, I say, see you later, Mom, I love you. You should love yours, too, no matter what goes on. You still say, I love you. You don't know when they could pass away. 
And uh, this is Melissa. This is all from the Watts workshop, this whole section here. This is not Melissa in the photograph. It's her friend, but it's like a surrogate for her. Uh, Melissa writes, if somebody asked me to join a gang, I think I would, because I would have another family on my side to back me up, but I would really have to think about it. People have asked me already to join their gang. Right now, I'm thinking about joining, but I just don't know. In ways, I am scared because innocent people might get hurt. I would feel like it's my fault, and I don't want my family in danger. This is um, the cover of a book, um, which is a book about an exhibition. Um, John Sarkowski was uh, a, an extremely influential curator of the, uh, photographs at the Museum of Modern Art. And his premise, or the premise of this exhibition was that photographers were either using their cameras as mirrors, where they were photographing an internal state, or they were using their camera as, a, as windows. And, uh, so, and he described that window as being like documentary photography, objective photography, and the interior would be more maybe um, assembled or arranged kind of photographs or manipulated photographs in some way. And I, take, I find that idea really strong, but I actually think that a photographer is both use, doing both at the same time. I don't really believe that there is such a thing, at least I don't think I'm doing objective documentary. I always think that I'm a part of it, that, um, that my role in it cannot be denied and that I interject my own essence in that process as well. So I look at photography as both a mirror and a window. Um, and this is a portrait that one of the workshop participants took of me. I had picked up a broken pl uh, playpen and held it up like it was my own prison. And um, I'm not gonna read you the text, but it's based on a meditation to Kuan Yin, who is the Bodhisattva of compassion. Um, I don't know if I'm out of time. If I am able to, I wanted to show a five minute video that gives you an idea of what the workshop was like. It, would that be okay? We started late, so I yeah. Okay. Okay, and then there was a little bit more work that is totally unrelated to the quote-unquote documentary projects. If any of you want to s stay after and look at it with me, I'd be glad to show you a few more slides on my laptop, but I don't, um, okay, so let me escape from this and So um, actually, the, the gentleman who helped me make this promo video, he's here tonight, Edward Landler, who is a documentary filmmaker who, um, who made the, uh, the uh, feature-length documentary about Watts Towers. Um, and I'm so glad he could be here tonight.
There are now adults in this workshop as well as teens and sometimes there have been pre-teens. Freedom to me is the ability for every person to be able to do or speak their desires but yet not infringe on others. Freedom entails certain control of oneself. And I'm thinking this time around, instead of having a separate title page for kids and a separate title page for adults, but just to say people in lots, and then the end page also just say people in lot, or I'm calling it a multi-generational project. Does that feel comfortable for, for you guys? Do you like that idea? Yeah. yeah. I kind of like the idea of the people in Watts better than individual genres because although the community is full of different people, ages, race, races, religions, all that, so I think that would be better. You know, I like the people idea also just, I think it would be nice to put like multicultural since it's different. Um, I like um, the word residence, I think we all recite Watts. I'm very interested in photography. This program just to me, like, it's fun. I really like this workshop because it's nice to know that we're all from the same community and I would have probably never um, seen this part of it. I was surprised about the class because I had to go back and teach my own. I actually like the idea that we're all here because it brings a different story to the table. It's good to learn from other people's life and what they've been through and what you can compare to their life as well. So I like the idea that we're all here and that we all make um, a community, you know, and sharing each other's ideas and respecting them, it's, it's healthy. I'm very See how it has the pearly side? Right. That side's gonna face away from it. Isn't it cool how the image disappears? Oh, you have a lot going on here. Okay, so we're going to work on mounting these pictures. How many pictures do we supposed to have? It's up to you. You're going to go ready from that side out. Yeah. You remember? Yeah. So you can see the books were, um, they're beautiful, personal, small books that can open up out of the cover in accordion fold out and we could um, do wall displays, which took forever to hang, but um, uh, were really, um, really drew you in. And um, um, I, I'm actually, through this, pro I'm actually starting to digitize. The work is huge. Um, for 15 years I've been archiving all of these photographs and writing, and this is just like the tip of the iceberg on that material. Thank you very much. Um, give um, I also teach here. Uh, I teach painting, life drawing, drawing. Uh, I used to teach art history sometimes, and I also teach at Cal State San Bernardino, and I teach uh, all the painting and drawing classes out there, like. Um, and what else? I guess I'm just going to start. Uh, I'm from California, and uh, my first school I went to was uh, Pacific Northwest College of Art in Oregon. And I went there for two years, and uh, it was a very structured college where you went from like 9 in the morning till 6 at night, and you took classes all day. But it learned, I learned a lot of technique. Like I had to go to the morgue to dry, draw anatomy, and. You know, so that kind of helped later, but after two years there, um, I decided to switch to the San Francisco Art Institute. It's like blinding, huh? 
And uh, I don't have any images from my undergraduate time because uh, I'm so old that uh, they didn't really tell us about taking images. So I never took slides or anything like that of my work. And then I had a crazy boyfriend that when I broke up with him, uh, broke into my house and cut up all my paintings. So I only have two pieces left from uh, undergraduate and I don't have images of them. And uh, so I uh, got my BFA in painting and drawing at the San Francisco Art Institute. And um, I think for me, most of my motivation, early motivation in doing my art, I mean, was probably what people told me I couldn't do. Uh, so if someone said I couldn't do something, I was going to do it. Um, when I went to school, uh, there were no women in art history books. Uh, Jansen's was entirely men. Um, my sculpture teacher up in Oregon, basically, because I probably would have done sculpture instead of painting. Uh, basically, no matter what I did, he always would basically say, oh, there's no way you're gonna be able to do that. You're not gonna be able to figure that out. You know, like laminating wood together and using all the tools. So it's kind of like a, as soon as someone said, you can't do that, it's like, okay, I'll show you. I'm gonna do it. Uh, so then after um, getting my BFA, I basically, because the guy cut all my paintings up, uh, I couldn't go right back to graduate school. So I had to rebuild my portfolio. So I basically worked, I was a seamstress, I was a photo retoucher, I uh, worked in bars, like she was talking about working in bars, I was a bartender. And I kind of built up my work and then I decided to go back up to San Francisco, I moved to San Diego. And I went to um, San Francisco State to get my MA, and they didn't have an MFA program at the time, just an MA program. So this is probably one of the paintings, I only have a few from my MA, and this is a watercolor. And again, it was one of those things where it's kind of like traditional painting was oils, and that was the kind of masculine thing to do, and a lot of my work was influenced by feminism, and uh, the idea of doing I did my entire master's degree just doing watercolors because again, it was like, no, this is not a traditional media. This is not as, as a, I don't know, muscular. It's a, kind of like a hobbyist medium. Uh, my teachers were well-known photorealists, uh, Robert Bechtel, uh, Richard McLean, and they were very, um, again, modern artists where they didn't really believe in a lot of content and I was, you know, coming up during, again, feminism and all these other kind of postmodernism started to develop. And so I was, again, kind of a fighting tradition. And I was looking at a style of painting called Trump Loy. Anyone ever hear that? Yeah, and I was looking at artists, um, John Frederick Peto and William Harnett. And traditionally that, you know, they usually did very masculine subject matter. Usually it was the hunt. And so you would have a, you know, dead animals hung on walls and um, weapons. And so instead I was doing, I don't know, I guess more sexual imagery. Um, so this is done from like a, a still life. I set it up on my wall in my house and then I would work from that. And it was really kind of talking about, again, how women were framed in society basically, right? Either. Uh, um, domestic stereotypes or sexuality. Uh, so this one's all watercolors. Are they kind of in focus? Yes, no? Uh, this one's also watercolor, a little bit larger, 60 by 40. Um, let's see if I have some more information about these. Uh, let's see. So I was basically, I was challenging the tradition of trompe l'oeil and um, looking at contemporary images that kind of frame gender in a social context, uh, let's see, which reinforce gender roles and stereotypes. I chose bras, underpants, um, like coupons. This is a bra advertisement over in the corner. So I got things out of magazines um, and other kind of fetishized images such as gloves, ropes, so again, suggesting or reinforcing sexuality, kind of a liberated sexuality because the time period I was coming up in, 
uh, that was very much an important thing for women that we had were liberated sexually that you had the pill that you I was also a punk this is kind of the beginning of punk music so I was either working painting or going out to see bands like the Sex Pistols and the Cramps and uh, the Dead Kennedys I went to school with uh, Jello Biafra so I was kind of you know my world was either making well the whole art world art and music world of the Bay of San Francisco basically uh, so this one is, what's the images? Oh, um, I was also looking at some of these images of um, ropes and sailor knots and things like that. So I would collect all these books that show different kinds of knots. So again, kind of mixing the laundry lines, the masculine and the feminine. Uh, bondage. Uh, then, let's see. Oh, during that time, I also worked as a graphic designer and illustrator, uh, illustrated multiple books. Uh, graphic design back then was very different than it is now. Of course, we didn't have computers, um, so everything was hand done, right? You had to go have someone do your type, and you did your drawings, and you went and got your uh, prints done, and you kind of put it all together. Uh, then I finally decided uh, after, I don't know, I was probably lived in the Bay Area then for about eight years. So I just finally decided I wanted to go get my MFA instead of just an MA because with an MA at that point it was harder to teach and I thought maybe I wanted to teach instead of doing all the graphic design and everything. Uh, and I got into Ohio State University so I moved from San Francisco to Ohio. but. It was a very big school. It's like one of the largest schools in the country and they only take six people in the painting program. Um, so it was kind of prestigious to be able to get into the school. Uh, also, when you get into a big school like that, everything's paid for. So they waive your tuition. Um, they pay for you to teach one class. They gave me a studio. It's kind of like, ah, this is a dream, you know? I actually didn't have to work full time. I just had to teach my one class and then I had lots of time to devote to painting. This was just a sketch when I first got there, so it's still transitioning kind of from what I was doing, and this was just a sketch for a painting that I never did, because I kind of decided to, a new program, it was kind of like, you know, move into something different, experiment a little bit. So it's kind of the first time I started to do oil painting instead, and I moved away from doing objects, and for some reason, I, well, I know why. I illustrated this book about sharks uh, in the, when I was in San Francisco, and I got very interested in them. Uh, but this is like watercolors underneath, so all the organs. So I paint on paper instead of canvas, so this is a large sheet of, of watercolor paper. And the organs are, were all done in watercolor, and then I sealed it with uh, clear acrylic gel medium, right? and then I painted everything else with oils on top. So it was kind of like a chance to start experimenting with both materials, methods. I was also getting more interested in theory, um, you know, looking at post-structuralism. Um, I was also into, you know, like Julia Kristeva, feminist theory, and uh, I was kind of starting to use, like before I used clothing to kind of suggest the figure, right, and suggest sexuality. And then I kind of moved away from the clothing and the objects and I was using, for just a really short period of time, these animals and fish to kind of, they were kind of a, still having to do with sexuality, sensuality, fertility, um, the body, but I wasn't quite moving into the figure yet. I was also interested in, um, at Ohio State, I, at the end of my first year, I won a travel grant. There was two of us, so I got a travel grant to go to Spain for a month and study Velasquez and Zubron. Um, you guys know D Diego Velasquez, right? Does a really dramatic light. Um, I was also looking at um, El Greco, right? With his mannerist exaggerations, which is what kind of influenced this painting, was the way the tails are all kind of going up like this kind of exaggerated figures. And who else? Goya. And then I also was looking at a, an artist who was a contemporary artist in Spain called M. Antonio Tapies, anyone ever heard of him? You? Yeah, he's a master of matter, they call him. So he has his own like museum in Barcelona, and it was all about the different surfaces that he could create. And I basically got the grant because I talked about that I wanted to go and study traditional glazing, oil glazing, 
and uh, their use of light. So I was really interested in light and light creating volume, but I still was not necessarily doing really realistic um, things. I was kind of allowing myself to be a little more abstract, a little more playful, but playing with material. So Tapiez influenced me in this piece by, uh, let's see, what is this? This is um, this great big kind of cocoon shape is a piece of paper, and then it has things collaged on it. Uh, the area on the right hand side, I ripped a piece off my attic. I lived in this old, old house built in like 1890, and up in the attic was this great tape. So I kind of took that off the attic wall and attached it onto this, and this is uh, wood on paper. And then the piece down at the bottom is watercolor on paper that I cut out and attached. And there's still things that are relating to the same content. They look different, but this is called adapter. It actually was called feminine adapter once. And these two objects, the kind of object inside this cocoon thing and the object on the floor was something I saw in an advertisement, a way for women to be able to pee outside, mm. right? <laughs> um, so again, I was still looking at the same kind of odd, like I collect all kinds of uh, advertisements and information and things that have to do with you know both male and female. Um, but I was probably still more interested in female at the time. Now I do, I really do both. Uh, so it has contemporary things mixed with, contemporary images and ideas mixed with art historical images and ideas and art historical methods. So everything else is oil glazes. So I, I because I was a watercolorist for so long, you know, like, I, I did watercolor as an undergrad also. I did oils and acrylics too, but I, I focused on watercolor at the, my last year at the San Francisco Art Institute. And then for my whole masters that when I do oils, I kind of work them as if they're watercolor. So I don't use white paint. I wipe everything out. So all the whites is just, I put down glazes and then I wipe it back out with a rag to kind of get that glow. Uh, drawing that I did during that time period uh, when I was down in Spain and I was uh, that was the the bowl is from a Velasquez painting so I kind of you know appropriated again postmodernism appropriation you know using different signs and symbols from different sources and putting them together so I kind of took this bowl right from a Velasquez painting and then the other things are domestic items uh, you know wooden spoons cooking and uh, the thing in the back is a, um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> it's a diaphragm, right? So again, always kind of talking about uh, sexuality. But it looks like a little inverted bowl, you know? I like the echo of the two bowls, but kind of the opposite. And the rest is graphite. So the bowl is oil, and again, it's on paper, and then everything else is graphite. And uh, I was also playing with perspective space in this. Uh, so these are all from graduate school. Um, this is, uh, again, after I got back from Spain, I had taken a lot of photographs. So I started to work from some of my photographs that I took. Uh, instead of just working from a mix of paintings and photographs and actual objects. So this one is, uh, I think it was a photograph of my husband um, in uh, Barcelona. and so. It's also mixed media. The entire table is watercolor, which I cut out meticulously around it, and then I glued that onto a wood support. And then everything else is oil, except the floor is actually the wood of the panel. So I left that ungessoed. So instead of like when I was doing photorealism, and I was doing that trompe l'oeil, and I had every detail and every texture. In this, I was you know allowing myself that I don't have to do all of that. I could have areas where you know, it was looser, or um, I was just letting the materials exist on their own instead of having to do all this careful rendering. Uh, let's see, where am I? So I passed all this. Uh, this is near the end of uh, graduate school at Ohio State. Um, I was also interested in, uh, I forget who this was. Who was I looking at? Oh, Zubron's uh, Virgin Martyrs, uh, you know, and they do a lot of these very religious paintings with Virgin Martyrs who usually have signs and symbols for, you know, what they um, were martyred. Like uh, St. Agatha was her breasts, and in his painting he has a 
you know, a woman holding a platter with cut off breasts on it. Uh, there's, you know, one of them has her eyes that are po poked out of her head and they're on sticks or something, or they're on a plate. So when I was down there, I was kind of looking at all the virgin martyrs. And then when I came back, I, again, this is another one after the going to Spain, and I was combining these contemporary things like the jello mold, which is kind of acting like a halo in this one. Um, this is watercolor, oils, the papers ripped and sewn back together. And then the big uh, white oval is vellum laid on top of the figure. And on the breasts, those markings are like from a magazine article about how women are supposed to check their breasts for lumps. Mm -hmm. So, you know, again, it's kind of a combination of, of different art historical information and signs and symbols. And I, and usually like for the jello mold, I, I made a jello, you know, mold, so, and I lit it from underneath so it kind of glowed. Um, so I work from that. So I either work from sets that I make or I work from a mix of that and photographs. Let's see if there's anything else. No, I guess that was it. So I'm basically juxtaposing these domestic images and artifacts with a historical narrative. Um, after uh, grad school, I was, they, I was hired back as a lecturer at Ohio State for a year. Um, and then I uh, got a position at the University of Southern Maine, so I moved, again, I went from, I'm from California, but I went from uh, San Francisco to Ohio, and then I went to Portland, Maine. And uh, up there I was teaching classes where I was mixing theory and practice, so I had students uh, having to read a lot of, again, post-structuralism, um, feminist theory, um, like we were looking at things like um, beauty, and the sub subversive potential of uh, visual and aesthetic pleasure. So they had to read like uh, Carol Becker, Herbert Marcuse, Julie Kristeva, Adorno, Walter Benjamin. So they would actually have to do a lot of reading of theory and then they would uh, do artwork that kind of didn't really, it's not like you're, you're, you're illustrating that but those, eyes de uh, those ideas would kind of help to build narratives or build um, conceptual ideas within their artwork. It was kind of like a framework. Uh, on my own, I was um, teaching and you know, ex still exploring materials and methods and still looking at, again, I just started to do more figures. So slowly the figures came in at the end of grad school. They've continued, I still do, sorry, <laughs> I still do figures now hiccup. And uh, this one was a mix of oils and gold leaf. And uh, again, it was kind of this, seeing these, these domestic objects as kind of dangerous objects, the idea of domestic bliss or, or um, even now, you know, when you look at contemporary culture and we're still having this discussion, we're still discussing that women don't make as much as men working at the exact same jobs, right? So it's something that doesn't really, hasn't really changed even though this has been going on for, for years. Some things change, some things don't. Uh, so this is, uh, I think I use my own legs, and those are like a weights on my legs, you know, for exercising. But it was, again, about being kind of bound. Uh, this was one I, where I was kind of influenced by some of Christie's, uh writings and uh, elemental pulsation was a, a term that she talked about and again it's kind of talking about embodiment um, and I had then moved from Maine to Georgia so I had a position in Portland for a couple years and then I moved down to Rome Georgia uh, where I started as a I had a part-time position down there that then became a full-time position uh, Georgia was kind of a shock for me being from California it was uh, the rural South, which was very different. And in this one, I was, again, I do feet a lot, or I started to do feet because it suggests the figure, but it's not, it's a little more mysterious. Uh, it's still intimate. It's not because I have a foot fetish. I don't have a foot fetish. Uh, but I do really love drawing them, I have to say, uh, hands and feet. But I move into whole bodies at some point. Uh, but I'm uh, still playing with mixed media and, um, the different things on there, like that paper up there, I was in a, this house and that was the wallpaper and it had uh, little balances, um, which, you know, like in Egyptian time, you weigh your 
your souls in the, in the balances, right? So that's what that is. And down here, and I have it also inside these funnels. And I was doing funnels a lot because they're kind of these um, both male and female symbols. Um, and then this is uh, fingernails and hair and uh, resin that's kind of spilling out of the funnel. And I uh, had finally had kids and you don't really see them influencing the work very much as far as I don't have images of my kids, though that will happen. But it was more influencing it in this kind of, I don't know, physical, bodily way. Um, and so I had just like collected fingernail clippings for a long time to put in there. I know it's kind of weird, but I also taught printmaking. And this is a mono print with Chine Cole, um, which is over here in the funnel. And the mono print is a print where that you only have one print. Uh, you don't have multiples like etching, but each color is a different run through the press. So I do it more like a traditional printmaking instead of, you can just take a plexiglass plate and then you know paint on it and run it through the press and wipe it out. But I basically ink my plate up and then I wipe out um, what I don't want to print, leaving the color behind that I want to print. So this is probably about five colors, five color run and the lace at the very end is just lace. You just ink it up, you know, and I laid it on top of the plate and ran it through. Uh, most of this work I had to show at Vanderbilt University, and uh, most of this work was shown at Vanderbilt when I was down there. Um, I then had a second child. The first one didn't really impact my work very much. I have to say there, you know, having children as, a, as an artist, as a woman artist, is something that most women artists think a lot about because it, it definitely impact can impact your career uh, because it you know besides working it, it takes a lot of extra time um, my second child my son was born with all kinds of medical problems he had to have heart surgery at two months old um, he had to have eye surgery at 14 months old he had to have jaw surgery at two four like he just had his last one at, at 21 um, a year ago. So he had all these issues. So I actually had to stop painting. I, I actually didn't paint for maybe a year and a half, two year period because I didn't have time. You know, I, I spent, like I lived in a Ronald McDonald house in Atlanta, you know, while he was having heart surgery. And uh, I still was working the whole time. And uh, it was so stressful that I couldn't really function and actually make artwork. So when I first went back to making artwork, the work kind of moved a little bit away from uh, being more social, political, right, and more personal. It, you know, it's like the only way I could kind of get back to it, which is what this is. I was also living in Georgia, and I wasn't used to tornadoes. Um, you know, out here I'm quite used to earthquakes. It's not a big deal, but tornadoes were just like horrifying. I remember having to grab my kids out of the their beds, you know, and run into the hall when a, a tornado would come through town. So this was kind of how I was feeling. So the first, this is the first painting I did after I could finally, you know, it's like, okay, I'm just gonna start painting now. After he was kind of out of the woods and I knew everything was okay. And I can't actually see the clock, so just tell me how fast I have to talk. <laughs> okay, so again, this is oils, but I also was right there. So he, had, he was really great at drawing. So he drew everything to let us know what he was doing. And there's electrodes in there and there's an etching of a teacup and I have the teacup in there during this time period because I drink tea, I'm not a coffee drinker and it was kind of like my only moment of sanity in a day, This, if I could just make a cup of tea and have like a couple of minutes just to drink it, which I almost never got to it, you know, a sip and then it, that was it. So it kind of like became this symbol for me of just some sort of order. Um, and then I put my kids in there. And there's like electrodes and stuff from, oh, and bills, um, hospital bills. And uh, bills from, you know, I almost went bankrupt during this time because of, of all the medical bills. So it was really just about the chaos in my life, which is why it's called Fission Fusion. So my, my work kind of goes, you know, started less personal and then kind of got more personal and then, you know, has moved away from that now. Uh, so this was another one that I did. Again, these are I showed in, in Atlanta, um, a couple of museums in the South, at Vanderbilt University, uh, 
These were a little larger, they're on paper. So I started using myself and my kids. And again, there's that teacup again. And this one, uh, the, like the dress is just graphite, so it's drawn and then I seal it. And then I do the oil painting on top. And it was just kind of going along with that feeling. Bounties, burdens, uh, that's because, you know, you might not admit it, but having children can be wonderful bounties, right? And amazing things, but they can also be amazing burdens um, as far as just worrying about them and stress and, you know, all of that on top of you. I don't look very happy, do I? <laughs> <laughs> and then there's also aluminum leaf in there. I started playing with more, and I kind of exaggerated the proportions on it to make it a little more dramatic. And this is another one. And it's still personal, but I don't know, they're getting older, and I was starting to kind of look back at art historical references. So I was looking at um, Vermeer and his domestic scenes and the way he uses light. Um, and actually the background is from a Vermeer painting where he has one of the maps behind the figure, so I kind of appropriated it, changed it a little bit. Um, and then there's gold leaf and graphite in it. I actually showed these when I moved out here too, though I had, they were a little older, but I showed them at a few places in LA. Um, then I moved from Georgia. Uh, I didn't want to stay there, for, I was like six years in Georgia and I didn't want to stay there forever. I, I didn't actually want to raise my kids in rural Georgia. It was just a little too um, racist for me and, and strict and, and uh, backwards, you know, uh, the school I taught, it was great because both my husband and I both had full-time positions, the same college. We had daycare on campus. We had an elementary school on campus. But, you know, I, I couldn't have nude models uh, because it was a Baptist school, so they had all these rules, and I, you know, I just didn't want to stay in that environment. So then I got a position at Bucknell University in Pennsylvania in Lewisburg. I was a visiting artist up there. Uh, so we moved to Pennsylvania, and I was still doing work that, um, this one started in Georgia, and then it kind of continued. I actually started, I taught down at Valdosta State one summer for the Governor's Honors Program, and I was pregnant uh, with my, so this was before my son, so this one I was pregnant with my son, and uh, had my daughter in it. And again, it's kind of about the way she was copying my, my position and my pose. And then I kind of continued it later as she got older um, when we were up in Pennsylvania. So I kind of continued the series. And I always, again, like the last one, had the little Disney uh, things on the clothing. This one has Pokemon, I think. So there's still always these kind of references to um, contemporary culture. These are just oil and wood. Um, well, I was also up in uh, Pennsylvania at Bucknell, 9-11 happened, and um, being close to New York City, I had like over half my students had uh, either parents or friends that were in the Twin Towers, so it was one of these just hellish days where people were getting phone calls and, and uh, trying to find their, if their parents were okay or their family members. And I just remember what, you know, having my students going through that and we were turning TVs on and watching all the people jumping out of the buildings. Um, so it was started to kind of get reflected in my work. These are two watercolor panels, so each one's 40 by 60. So the whole thing when it's put together is 120 inches. Uh, and of course, I, I'm not really comfortable, at least at this point I wasn't using images from the newspaper. Uh, somehow it just feels like I'm violating that image somehow. I don't really like to uh, copy other source material. So <laughs> that's actually my husband bouncing on the trampoline. So I had him bounce on the trampoline. I took a lot of pictures of him, you know, in different positions and me doing a handstand. And then we, I kind of, you know, moved those into the back of the house just to kind of get that falling feeling. And I also decided to limit myself on color for a while. Um, go back to just black and white. So this is just all, you know, in watercolors, you can get like 10 different blacks. So I was just using all these different blacks, kind of build the surface, create atmosphere, play with light, and create a mood. And so I kind of did a series where I was doing the, these watercolors about, more about relationships. 
And actually, I'm not even sure where I am, but I know I have to go faster. So I'll go faster. Uh, so I kind of uh, moved into more disaster kind of things. And this was uh, after the, some of the flooding and hurricanes. Um, and uh, I was looking at some images and used parts of them and then used parts of things that I took pictures of. And again, it's watercolors. I think it was for Hurricane Katrina. And this is watercolor and wax. So they were kind of moving away from me, a little less personal and a little more um, social, political. Uh, then I moved to California. Uh, so I moved back to California, I guess I should say, uh, after being gone for quite a few years. I think I moved back in like 2002, 2003. And uh, I was living in a condo and it kind of, you know, the whole California landscape in Southern California, I'm more used to Northern California was kind of impacting me. And I was also looking at, um, who was I looking at? Um, Martini, oh God, I can't remember. Some Gothic painters where the figures are too large for the spaces, they're inside interiors. Simone Martini, and they kind of, you know, crowd out of the space, this exaggerated space. That had been a neighbor of mine in Pennsylvania, uh, who was also a professor. And so I usually use a friends, neighbors, family members to take pictures, and I was moving away from family, and I was taking pictures of other people to use. So I used her and the rest of her family, and I was kind of inserting them in these spaces, kind of talking about um, suburban culture. And it's all oil with uh, just graphite in the background. Um, then uh, I really moved back to California because uh, my mom was getting older and she seemed to really want me to come back even though I have three older sisters. Uh, so I got back for her and she uh, sold her house and moved in with me. Um, and then within a year she was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. So I think she kind of knew that she needed to live with someone. So she moved in with me and she had Alzheimer's and I had my two kids and I taught and used to write her just tons of notes all day and make her lunch and would leave them and then my kids would kind of help take care of her. She never got to the point where she absolutely couldn't remember me or anything, but you know, she, she couldn't drive anymore. She couldn't, she would really kind of forget things. So then she passed away in 2006 and again I had a short time where I really couldn't do any artwork because she lived with me. Um, and I was really close to my mom uh, because my dad died when I was like 14, so I was always kind of with my mom. So after she died, this is kind of like the first painting I did after she died, and I was interested in cloning. And I started to get very interested in uh, um, neuroscience and how the brain works and the idea of, again, identity and who we are. Uh, so this idea of cloning you know, would she be the same person? Would she be a different person? Of course, obviously, she's not gonna be the same person because twins aren't the same person, right? They are identical DNA, but the way, you know, nature nurture, the way that, you know, we are brought up or, or what we're around, we form different identities. But that's what this was kind of born of, and this is like a, a watercolor, so it's really, really large, 100 inches. And I, I had taken this black and white photograph of her, um, so I did this kind of portrait when she was older. Uh, and she really liked dahlias, and dahlias are also one of those things that gets cloned, plants get cloned a lot. Uh, so it was really kind of about cloning and, and identity. That's a close up. So getting in more contemporary stuff. There's another one, but I did my daughter and my mother kind of merge together. And this is also really large. It's about 100 inches in length. And uh, all the images in the back are done with carbon ink, like carbon paper, and then I would draw through it so it would go onto the paper. And it's um, brain waves and plaques and tangles and neurons from uh, having Alzheimer's, right? And that's all the images in the background, except there's also some top topographical maps back there. And the great big uh, yellow area is uh, artificial resin. It's like a 
resin that's uh, more pliable, so you can have it on paper and I can still roll it up so I can easily ship it when I show it. Uh, what else about it? Oh, it's kind of in a figure eight, um, which is also you know about infinity, right? The figure eight. So there's always different layers of meaning in there for me. Some of them are important to be read. Some of them aren't, aren't that important to be read, but uh, it just kind of adds to it if you, if you recognize it. So this is also, this is this whole cloning series that I was working on. This one was a little more uh, weird. It was my daughter and me, and again, it's about aging, um, identity, aging. Uh, it's called, what's it called? Yeah, cloning it over again. Um, so mortality, change. Um, all the, the decoration around that looks like this kind of floral decoration. They're all blood cells that I drew. Uh, I started this at a um, residency. So I've had a lot of residencies. I had a residency when I was in Georgia at the Himmel of, God, I forget the name of it. I have it someplace in here. <laughs> um, then I went on a residency during this time at the Kimmel Harding Nelson Center for the Arts in Nebraska. What was the other one called? I can't remember it. Uh, so this is all oils except for the drawing in the background. Uh, this is one I did of the cloning thing and I used my son and this was really about gender identity. I remember my son was always getting dressed up by his sister um, <laughs> to look like a girl, right? You know, and he loved it. He thought it was great. So just that, again, that idea of who we are and how we become who we are, you know, uh, what we're comfortable with. So I kind of put him both as, uh, as a girl and a boy with the resin around it. Uh, this is phylogenic system, so again, it's kind of about, um, which is often used in plants and uh, evolution, right? And this is watercolors, but a lot of things are cut out. And so the whole uh, phylogenic system there, the structure is like cut back, cut out and then put back on top. Uh, thick oil paints, resin. This was my space at Kimmel Harding, where you can see I was finishing up that one painting and started some new paintings. And what sometimes what uh, residencies allow you to do, residency you apply for if you get in. Um, I usually apply for residencies that pay me or a small amount. Um, you're usually there like a month, and so you get a space, and uh, all you have to do is work, right? For me. I, I don't get sabbaticals, so it's a it's a time to you know take off and get a lot of work done, um, where I'm not having I'm not teaching. Not that I, I shouldn't say not having to teach. I do love teaching, but sometimes just having that block of uninterrupted time, right? Not having uh, parents or children or you know friends or all those things, all those distractions. So you're just there and you just work, and. Uh, you know, they give you a small allowance so, you know, you can eat and things like that. Plus, you're there with other artists. So you get this interaction and this feedback and, uh, you know, you, you build a community and they come in and they help you. You know, you talk about each other's work and we went out to eat all the time, which was great. And it's a mix of uh, visual artists. Uh, there was a composer. There was a writer. Uh, so it's a mix of all the arts. And so, yeah, don't I look happy again? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I look tired. Um, and, and when I'm at, at the residencies, I really feel like I have to be in my studio all the time. So basically, you know, I'm, I'm in there like eight, nine, and then I'm in there till, you know, one or two at night just working. You know, I might go and take a break for a drink and, uh, you know, sometimes we would all go to bars or uh, a drink and dinner and then you, everyone would come back and work at night. So I really was kind of pushing myself. And it also allows you to experiment. So I kind of moved away from what I was doing with that cloning series and I really needed to, I have to say after my mother died, I was in a massive depression for a few years. So this allowed me to kind of move on. Um, and I started to do new work and I was working on these, uh, this is one I, I started but I never finished. It was an idea of all these connected heads on, they're all on, drawn on vellum paper. But, and this is a little watercolor I did but this is what kind of came out of it, and this led me into a new area. Um, and this was this uh, kind of about uh, migration, um, mapping 
uh, movement. I always like to move. Uh, you know, again, how all those things affect us, immigration. Um, and, I, and these I actually, the heads I did find in uh, newspapers and magazines. So it was, you know, articles. And I kind of was using people I didn't know, which was kind of a, a break for me. And then I have maps and wallpaper and stuff in there. And uh, all the lines are markers. So I just drew with marker. And then I did oil painting on top of it. And that kind of led me to this. And then I did this large series, um, which I've shown a bit in the LA area and the Bay Area and, and back east of this kind of uh, series of work about public and private space. And it kind of came from, again, looking at all these images of wars uh, where people are covered with blankets when they're injured. And the only thing separating them from public space is the blanket, right, which creates kind of a private space that they're underneath. So that's why it's kind of a, a, a map, a topography in the, that they're laying on. And the blanket always also acts kind of like a map or a topography. But uh, it's also kind of creating this, this privacy. Uh, so it kind of started from looking at these different scenes. And it's kind of my interpretation of this public and private sphere. This one was from a Manet painting called um, The Dead Toreador. So I'm still looking at artists having art historical references. And in Manet's painting, he originally painted an entire bull ring with a dying Toreador in it. Uh, but then he just kept painting and painting things out. And so he ends up painting out all the signifiers, which means he's painting out all the information. So you don't really have a sense of the space. You just have the dying Toreador, right, laying there. So again, it's like this, it's this uh, spectacle, right? Bullfights are spectacles. So this, this dying Toreador is having this very private moment. Death is a very private moment, right? In this spectacle of public space. Uh, so I was kind of appropriating that idea and I you know, set up a figure and, and put the blankets on top of them. Again, kind of talking about this public and private space. And this is, uh, they show together up at Headlands Center for the Arts in um, the Bay Area. So that was the exhibition they were in. I really liked how they put them together because it's like the one little piece of this fabric, which was the, you know, the bullfighting thing, which I made into kind of like a topography. Kind of echoes the point of the other one, the end of the other blanket. Uh, so I kind of continue this a little bit, uh, more having to do with all the homeless people that I see I'm sure we all see every day at this school, everywhere in Los Angeles. And uh, I actually crocheted an entire blanket that is in these circles, because I wanted the actual blanket to look like kind of these, these I don't know, bullseyes, um, but also kind of like a landscape at the same time. So I crocheted the entire blanket, and then I covered my family members and pulled a mattress out in the backyard uh, to kind of paint this again. So the idea of having this very small uh, public space in the middle of a landscape. Uh, a lot of these are sold. This one is uh, sometimes if my friends want to be in a piece, um, I will take photographs of them. So those are some friends of mine. And then I have to be able to show it, right? And then they buy it from me afterwards. <laughs> at a discount. I don't, you know, I mean, if you're in a gallery, the gallery gets, uh, you know, half or 40% of what you make. So if you're selling it right to your friends, then they get, you know, a much better price. And most of that, again, the blankets, those are markers and ink, and then everything else is oils. And another show at Mount St. Mary's, and I forget the other artist I was showing with. She does these wild sculptures. Do you guys recognize her? No? I can't remember her name. She shows quite a bit um, around here and in the Bay Area. They're all made out of found clothing. But they wanted large work because the, the gallery space is so gigantic at Mount St. Mary's. Uh, then I was kind of looking back at Goya again. He has a series called the, There is uh, No Remedy. There is still no remedy. And so I was kind of continuing that theme, you know, which again, politically and socially, I kind of feel that there is no remedy. I'm sorry to be so 
unoptimistic. I think there really is. I'm always out there battling it, but it was kind of, you know, talking about um, politics. Um, I also uh, had the, some logs kind of stand in for it, and this uh, title came from a Gorillaz CD, uh, the one where Lou Reed is singing the lyrics, some kind of nature, some kind of turf, or kind of talking about the artificiality of, uh, of nature. And again, I just pulled, it was my mom's old um, mattress and uh, set up a still life. And this one's watercolors. So these are all getting more recent. Um, probably the last one of my, well, I'm kind of moving away from the blanket series, but this was a series where I actually had pieces that lifted up. So this is multiple paintings. So it was about how things change. So that's the painting underneath. And then that was it with it on top. And that's just a close-up of all the blankets. Eventually, I get tired of blankets. And I started to move. Instead of having figures covered with blankets and, and kind of landscapes, I started to kind of have them turning into other things. Again, it's kind of as the idea of women being furniture or part of, part of the household, right? Uh, so figure at the end table. And these were some women I got off uh, online, and then I changed were taking pictures of their bodies after childbirth and how they had changed. A friend of mine who let me take her picture and use her figure acting as a room divider. So they're kind of inserted into uh, architectural scenes. And here I was playing with thin paint and thick paint and uh, overlapping shapes. Uh, this one was in a show not very long ago in Santa Fe. And um, again, it kind of went along with the other one about there's still, you know, there's no remedy and there's still no remedy. Still back to the blankets. Uh, soft target, again, the collateral damage, soft targets that figures are, um, that people are often the ones that, that pay the price for political, social um, horrors. But I was also kind of referencing, besides referencing social and political things. I was also kind of referencing um, uh, Jasper John's target that he painted, which is why I had all the bright colors in this one. And then I kind of started to finally move away from the blanket. So this is, uh, again, uh, watercolor, but I sealed it and I put oils on top of the figure. So figure is a black hole. So they're being more interrupted by materials at this point instead of being interrupted with other imagery. So it's more about the, the material object. Uh, figures as a table. Uh, this was in a um, show back east that was, oh, I should definitely find this one. Where is it? Where is it? Uh, the 21st Century Body Exhibition. It was a um, show uh, about Merlu Ponty which talked about embodiment and representation. And so the top part, again, that's kind of hearkening back to my trompe l'oeil, right? That's a little painting at the top of the original um, image that I found in a magazine. And uh, I reversed the figures in the lower one, so it's talking about representation, um, you know, what, what's real, what isn't real, how we see, how we interpret. Um, how the relationship between the figures change in the top where their two heads are together compared to in this one where their backs are together. So it's kind of just talking about um, representation. I still kind of have a blanket, but it's not really a blanket. So this is kind of more about viewfinders. Again, how we uh, position, how we, how we see things, how we view representation, uh, what part is more important to look at than others. So I started playing with viewfinders uh, to kind of, you know, frame certain sub parts of the subject and eliminate por some parts. I actually painted the entire figures. You can kind of see their faces underneath there, and then I covered them up. So instead of actually having paper on top, I've just painted on top. Uh, this was, again, when I was getting a little more political recently, um, post-truth. 
And this one was also, again, so it's a little, they're a little less personal. It was an image that I found and changed. Uh, these are new stuff. So it's much more about gender, identity, roles, um, personal just in the sense that it affects everybody, it affects all of us, right? But not personal in like, you know, my personal story at home or my home life or anything like that. But it's uh, about what's privileged, uh, male or female privilege. Again, what's privileged and how we see things. Um, who's privileged? And this is a mix of, uh, this is on wood, and it's a mix of the red and the yellow are acrylics. And then the figure underneath is um, oils. And then on top is uh, watercolor on paper that I have attached onto it. And then a piece of vellum. And then I, the tape looks like real tape, but I painted it so it looks like it's tape, but it's not actually tape. Mm -hmm. So again, it's a, a mix of what's real, what's represented, what's abstracted. A new watercolor that I thought was finished and I show and then I bring it home and I think maybe it's not finished and I go back into it. I can't quite seem to let loose of some of them. And originally this was called the, um, I changed my titles too, the geopolitical and the biological, which is why I kind of have the red and the blue and the yellow, primary colors, but also political colors. Uh, but then I've changed it. I think a leg up is a little more humorous, not so serious. And this is a piece I just had uh, like a little over a year ago. I had another residency at Mass MoCA, uh, which is now because they opened the second half of it, the largest museum as far as space, uh, I think in the United States. It's in um, Massachusetts, and it's just this amazing space in this small town. And so they had studios there for artists, and then you get access to all the, the museum. So I started this piece there. And again, it's this idea of, of framing, right? And uh, it's a mix of media. So this top little one on the very, very top is watercolor on paper, and then this is oils on paper. And then this I started working on canvas, which shock of all shock I have not worked on since I was an undergrad. Um, to actually work on canvas. And, and this is, looks like it's on paper, but it's really thick oil. So again, playing with materials, um, playing with relationships between figures, uh, uh, who's privileged, power structures, uh, sexuality and power and place. And I think I'm about then. Oh, this was just in a show in New York um, at Air Gallery, which is the first uh, women's gallery ever created or opened, and they were having a show that had, was about abortion, and so they invited um, artists to make a piece for it. So this is a piece that I decided to make for it, and I actually sewed a zipper, so there's a zipper in the canvas, so you can unzip it or zip it. So when it's unzipped, it's kind of, um, well, when it's zipped, it's kind of an act of, of defiance, right? When it's zipped, it's unzipped, it's kind of, you know, uh, I can't even think of the word I wanted to say. Aggressive. Um, so I, you know, I'm I'm definitely a hardcore feminist here, and uh, it was not a show just about pro-choice. It was a show that was supposed to show all viewpoints on both sides, but it was definitely a political show. And this is the most recent that's I think is done. Oh. Anybody have questions? Yeah, this is for you. Are you, are you planning on um, expanding your program and doing what we did? Are you planning on doing the same thing that you were doing in Watts and um, over in uh, the Hollywood area? Going to other counties and working with. Um, I, I am no longer writing this grant that particular program. Um, that was all a, a dark room based program and part of the program is called Science that was created and dedicated to the dark room. What I'm starting to think now is that it could easily be done with cell phones and writing and 